just amen. I told my sister, I don't like introductions. Because by the time you finish reading all of that, y'all have higher expectations. So if I flunk, y'all say, well, that was in her bio. <laughs> but we thank God for the opportunity to be here uh, with my Shiro in the faith, Apostle Wanda Sisko. Amen. I just love her dearly. Y'all come on. That's okay. It's all right. Amen. Amen. I just thank God uh, for the friendship over the years and for the sisterhood, for the love, for the mentoring. And I don't take it lightly because you don't get that everywhere you go. Amen. Amen. And Dr. Zena Pierre. Whoop, whoop. I'm glad I'm going first and she's going second. <laughs> But we came to do a little teaching this morning, and I don't know, I never leave anywhere with it, like, at least two amens, and so I usually bring them with me, and so my sister is here all the way from Tucson, Arizona, Deacon Antoine Beaton Leach, <laughs> amen, come to support her little sister, she's the oldest, I'm next, and then it goes downhill with the boys, but you know. Amen. And then the biggest cheerleader that I have is the love of my life, Deacon Eric Foster. Amen. Amen. I could not do this without him. Amen. After God, of course. Uh, this morning, for the time that is mine, I'm just, uh, leadership is such a large uh, topic, and so I'm going to just uh, drop a few nuggets on you, uh, but I have some flyers with me. Um, if you want to get one from me afterwards, I'm going to be doing a five-week leadership series on Facebook Live on my page, uh, Andrea, Foss, Andrea M. Foster, uh, Pathway to Kingdom Purpose. Um, I got permission from Apostle to do so so that I could develop it more. So some of the topics we're going to talk about over the next five weeks is leadership leprosy, dealing with the real struggles, pain, and isolation, then come hella high water, understanding God blessed us to lead in our identity in Christ. November the 4th, bread not broken cannot be shared. Uh, we are broken first as a process to minister to others. Uh, November the 11th, the menace of muddy waters, serving with integrity and representing our Christ. And then November the 18th, MSNBC, Marketplace Support Networks to Build Community, Learning the Difference Between Church Leaders and Kingdom Leaders. So if you are interested in that, see me afterwards, and I will give you a flyer uh, of those topics. Amen. Amen. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we thank you for divine invitations. God, we don't take them lightly. And so we pray that the wrestling and the struggling with your word would come forth by power of Holy Spirit, that what needs to be spoken in this hour will be spoken, that those who are being ordained, affirmed, and commissioned, and those who have already been in leadership for uh, seasons and years of time would find some encouragement, some enlightenment, and some empowerment. God, we thank you for what you are going to do in spite of who I am. And so we thank you in advance. Amen. Amen. So for those that like to take notes, um, if I were to entitle this, I would call it Pulling the Curtain Back on Leadership. Uh, pulling the Curtain Back on Leadership. Now, um, I know there's a Hammond over here. Um, so don't hit that note. Let me finish the teaching, and then you can hit that note. Amen. Amen. Bless you, sir. Pulling the curtain back on leadership. It seems that any time we teach on leadership, the subject would turn to how to walk in one of the fivefold ministries. And as I read through the Bible, I see many patterns that don't start with being a pastor or a prophet or an apostle. But I believe that the word teaches that it must start with one. And when we become leaders of one uh, and do that very well, then and only then can we become leaders of the more. 
uh, Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40 tells us that the disciples asked, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So to navigate to the next level requires, in my humble opinion, that we as leaders do some self-examination and some introspection on how we lead today. Because once upon a time, there was a church that worked. Its members loved each other, took care of the widows and the orphans, fed the hungry, and transformed cities. It taught the Bible, built believers to maturity, and that satisfied their longings in their heart to touch God. And so this church didn't just talk about the power of God. It healed the sick. It raised the dead. It cast out demons. It won the lost with incredible effectiveness. It discipled converts and equipped them to minister. Its effectiveness was not limited to one culture or ethnic group. It grew with explosive power wherever it was planted. And so pagan religion couldn't compete with it. Greek philosophy couldn't comprehend it. And persecution only perfected it. Where is that explosive growth and power today? What does it mean today to lead God's way? Because according to my ex, ex, uh, 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 explanation, what I see today is that pastors are becoming bivocational because resources are down. We fly to every conference after conference looking for a fix for our favorite celebrity preacher. Um, holiness for the leadership has become a thing of the past as long as folk have something to bring to the table we overlook their flaws and we overlook their foolishness and we have got to begin to examine what we are doing in God's house we cater don't say preach uh, we cater to the big tithers Evangelical is now a political term. Our leadership positions have no term limits. They are everlasting. Sidebar, the truth of the matter is, if you are really leading with your whole heart after two or three years, you need a break. And the truth of the matter is we need to have rotational leadership so that persons could refresh themselves and have a sabbatical and then come back in refreshed, not mad at everybody, not pouting, don't have an attitude because they tired. We need to begin to look at term limits. Our musicians, I'm just talking about the church. I'm just talking about the church today. Our musicians are selected for their talent and not for their worship. The committed are weary because 20% do all the work while the 80% meander into ministry as they will. We have Bible studies that superficially teach what others are teaching rather than get a revelation of the times in which we live from God. We turn to our neighbors seven times in the worship service and we didn't even say good morning. We are not anointed. For the new preachers, we are not anointed unless we're running three or four services on Sunday dock or we have five churches in five locations. We're not anointed, but we don't look at the good ministry that's being done with 50 or less that is transforming and changing cities. Ministers receive license to preach this year, and next year they're a bishop of 50 or less. And I saw a preacher, it disturbed me, Apostle. I saw a preacher on Facebook boasting that he had preached his initial sermon seven years ago, and he was now being consecrated as an archbishop. What have you done? What have you Set yourself down somewhere and learn something.
We have become enamored. Come on, sit, 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 sit. We become enamored with titles and locations and buildings and getting our praise on and running revivals. And we have not been touching the hearts of people. We have not been discipling them and equipping them and helping them to find their gifting and positioning them in the body. Okay, so somebody said, well, how you know all of that preacher? Well, let me tell you. Because, see, we have developed religious systems rather than a kingdom ecclesia. The apostasy that Jude 3 talks about speaks of it here. In religious systems, it's buildings and organizations and cathedrals and temples and 501c3s. But in the ecclesia, the church is the body of Christ made up of born-again believers. In the religious system, our identity is in the denomination. I'm Roman Catholic. You're Seventh-day Adventist. I'm Jehovah Witness or I'm Baptist. But in the ecclesia, our identity is in Jesus Christ. In religious system, just let me call the roll for a minute. In religious system, we place their faith in the church system and in its leadership, oftentimes placing, it, uh, uh, placing the pastor's view over and above the word of God. But in the ecclesia, people place God's word as the final authority in all practices of faith. In religious systems, it's once per week. We dress up, we smell good, we look nice. But in the ecclesia, we put on the whole armor of God every day of the week. In the religious system, the fellowship is defined by regular church attendance. But the ecclesia of fellowship is where two or three are gathered in his name. Let me do a sidebar here. You see, we have found out in this pandemic season what we have not been doing. Hmm. What we have found out is that we have been churchified or Christ or churchy. Christianity, but we have not been the ecclesia. And so we have learned how to be two or three gathered virtually. We've learned how the power of God still works where two or three by phone. We've learned by text where two or three gather. We can shout a text. We can still glorify God virtually. We can still praise his name. We have learned how to do ministry outside the four walls of the church. We have learned during this pandemic that a cracker is just as good as a wafer. We have learned that Welch's grape juice from the dollar store is just as good as the snack pack that they give us at church. We have learned. Uh, Jude is part of a healthy, vibrant group of leaders, and he is describing how evil persons and false teachers got into the community of faith. His description, as we can read in Jude 3, really sounds like it could be an article on the front page of the Washington Post. Many in the news think everything is all right. They think we're going to be fine. But Jude said we must contend for the faith and fight for it. We need to bring it back to the seal. We need to bring it back to the house. We need to get beyond fables and, and what the latest big dog said. And we need to turn to the gospels and begin to read again what Jesus has said. The last, last decade, uh, God began to reveal to his apostles what needs to be corrected. And God wants us to bring back his word. God wants us to bring back Jesus' teaching. The Father wants kingdom impact. He wants us to heal the sick. He wants us to raise the dead. He wants us to cast out demons. He wants us to disciple new converts. He wants us to begin to do the work of the mystery. I'm still talking about leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, many today don't even know the Beatitudes or the Acts 2 church. But listen to Acts 2 church. If we would read it, they had no lights, camera, or action, no cash app, no giveify, no PayPal, no Facebook Live, Instagram, or Messenger. But they experienced explosive growth. Growth, signs, wonders, and miracles followed what they did. 
Yeah. Uh, see, the church is limping because Ephesians 2 and 20 tells us that the church is built on the foundation of the apostle and the prophet with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And who in Christendom do we fear the most? It's the apostle and the prophet. And until we stop being scared of them, the church will stop limping. See, I, 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 I am just, uh, 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 just enamored with all of the, the demons and the PhDs and the doctors of theology and the DDs that we don't understand how Constantine set, a, set us up to fail, how he removed God's plan, the apostolic plan, how he removed it and elevated pastors. And we wonder why pastors are coming suicide. It's because I got news for you. God never intended for solo pastors to pastor churches. God intended for the team to work together. Uh, he intended for all five to come together. No big eyes, no little U's, no big dogs and little chihuahuas. But he planned for the team of five to come to do the work of ministry. Pastors are dying because they are trying to walk in all five and they're not call to all five in fact the truth of the matter is some pastors are killing churches because they're not pastors they're prophets I'm 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 still talking about leadership but see, we are living in a time where poverty is on the rise, racism and classism and ageism and sexism and every other ism is creating an increase in mental health counseling. Social media promotes challenges with competing voices, gun violence, and the need for greater is ever large before us. And our churchianity, hear this, our churchianity will not be sustainable in this move of God. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. Because in this season that we're in, death and grief is so prevalent because of COVID that it is hovering over the earth like a blanket and you just jumping and shouting, that's not going to help my grief. Your little cliches are not going to help when mama died. This is the season that requires a leader shift. Fresh oil coming from every leader. Every leader must know the sound coming out of the throne room of God. We as leaders must get a revelation for ourselves and stop copying and repeating somebody's bad theology because they put a shout on it. You're going to spread it. I don't care how a big dog it is. Bad theology is bad theology. And if you don't know the word of God for yourself, you're going to keep repeating bad theology. Uh, God is bringing the ecclesia back into apostolic alignment where the five ascension giftings he left work together to unite us by faith for the perfecting of the saints to edify the body until we are all fitly joined together, helping each other to grow in love. The job of leadership is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, not to do the work by ourselves. If you're a leader and you don't know how to delegate, you need to check your insecurities at the door because there's more gifts in the house than yours. I know your name is on the mantle outside, but there's more gifts in the house than yours. Ah, and the truth of the matter is, God sent those gifts to help you, but you so silly that you won't even recognize the gifts and accept them for what God is sending you. Uh, we must understand who we are in God. This is another area that I think we need some, some serious teaching and training on. We must understand who we are in God. And I think uh, that that's the biggest lesson that I could probably leave, one of the big lessons that I could leave with you as leadership. Because when people understand who they were in the mind of God, 
it releases them from the struggle of trying to be what others want them to be. Uh, uh, well, uh, see, when I understand who I was on God's mind, then that gives me license to you know. And I tell that gives me license to say, oh, no, I can't do that because that is not what I was created in the earth to do. Now, I ain't mad at you and we ain't fell out. OK, but the truth of the matter is the anointing is on what I was created to do, not on what you like me to do. Uh, uh, see when we when we understand uh, uh, this this is this should help somebody real good right here uh, when we understand that each of us carry a piece of the blueprint or the pattern for the next move of God we lead and serve differently because we realize we are part of something greater than ourselves do I need to repeat that for those in the back let me say that again when each of us understand that we each, somebody say each, each, each of us carry a piece of the blueprint or the pattern for the next move of God. Yeah. 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 You know, I could stop right there and just run around the church. And so then we lead differently. Because we realize that I can't sit home on my blessed assurance because my peace needs to come to church. Ooh, I, this is making me happy myself. Ah, let me press on, let me press on. Uh, everyone is called to lead. Whether you lead in an informal sense, don't miss this, or whether you lead in a position of the church as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are called to lead others to Christ. All right, I'm going to test everybody that's doing this. Each of us are called to lead, at minimum, somebody else to Christ. Uh, so let me let me let me get to my point for you for y'all don't think uh, that I know Bible, um, but uh, I want to pull back the curtain uh, from the perspective of four points, four patterns, and then um, then I'll take my seat. We look at who chooses the leader, who is in control of that leader, what it t takes to lead, and how are we to serve. The Holy Spirit gave me this. Revelation Apostle, and it just would not let me go. I've been fighting all week, had all kinds of books all over the place. Thank God my husband doesn't go in my study because books was everywhere. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit had me go to uh, this very familiar story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 in Mark chapter six and I'm not going to read all of it but just a portion of it but I want you to go back and read it and put beside it in your Bible leadership lessons and so if we start in Mark chapter 6 verse 36 it said send the crowds away so that they can go to nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat Jesus said you feed. with what they asked we have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have, he asked. Go and find out. Yeah. Yeah. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 and 100. The focus here is verse number 41. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, and he blessed it, then he broke it, and then he gave it to the disciples so they could con distribute to the people, and there was plenty left over. Let me say that again. J Jesus took the five loaves. He looked up to heaven, and he blessed it, and he broke it it and he gave it ah. see when we look I'm not gonna go into the story because I'll be here too long but when we look at it we see four part principle here the first principle is that Jesus took it 
Uh, even bread is more than bread. Uh, in the Bible, bread is not simply a dietary staple. A common food concerned daily bread is a picture of God's provision, the sustenance that arrives from his hands. In the wilderness, it fell from the sky, providing day-to-day -day nourishment for the people of Israel. But even when they entered the promised land and began to cultivate the ground, planting and harvesting, raising crops and livestock, they were to see God not in their own efforts, but as the source of the provision. God not only was their uh, source of provision, but bread is all for also a metaphor for the Torah, the law of the Lord. Just as bread came down from heaven to feed the Israelites in the desert, so the instruction of the Lord came to Moses on the mountain. And so the people were fed from these commandments because they said, and we know very, very well in Deuteronomy 8 and 3, because man could not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So daily manna was a metaphor for practical guidance as they walked continually as the covenant people of God. They were to consume the word, the scroll of the word of the Lord, as one consumes bread. Bread is also the way that Jesus demonstrated his passion for the crowds hanging on his every word. He fed them spiritually and physically. In fact, Jesus went so far in John 6 and 35 to call himself the bread of life. And so we see the fullness of the expression when Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed the bread and he broke the bread and he gave it. Some of y'all get that on the first Sunday. <laughs> so bread, as it turns out, is far more than just bread. It's far from being ordinary. And so it is with our lives. God works with the unspectacular and the common and the imperfect and the inadequate. Therefore, God takes the seemingly unordinary stuff of life and fills it with his glory. So here's the twist. If we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, then we become the bread of life as his representatives on the earth. Ah, some of you missed that. If we are joint heirs with Christ, who is the bread of life, then I, as his joint heir, become the bread of life today in the earth. So as Jesus took the bread, let me make it personal. So as Jesus took Andrea, and he blessed Andrea, and he broke Andrea so that he could give Andrea. Yeah. Ah, so Jesus takes the bread. He takes us and he blesses us and he breaks us so that he can give us to meet the needs of the crowds that are coming and who are hungry, who are sick, who are thirsty, who are bound. We are the bread of Christ. Our lives are just common. There's nothing spectacular about us as bread. But in Jesus' hands, we become something more. Every time Jesus, eh, when I read scripture, every time that Jesus took bread in scripture, he took it in his hand. Mm. And he did something supernatural with it. Eh. So he took the bread. He took you and me. And then the Bible says that he blessed it. In the hands of Jesus, your life becomes blessed. This blessedness is not about accumulating or achieving more things. Blessedness is about having your true identity recovered and your true calling revealed. It is to be given a new name. Once you were a sinner, now you're a saint. Once you were afar off, now you're part of a new family. Blessedness is about having our true identity recovered and our callings revealed. 
Being blessed is not a state of being. It's our story. It's your story. It's mine. If we let him, he will take us back to the start. Return us to the origin. Bring us back to the moment. He took us from eternity and he blessed us and he created us. And at the appointed time, like 2021, God orchestrated it so that we were sitting in eternity full of everything that the world needed. And he took us and he birthed us into the world at the appropriate time so that we would be released in the earth at this time and in this season. You are not too early and you are not too late. Your birthday matters because God had you born at this time. Uh, to be blessed is to be who we originally were created to be in the mind of God. Yeah. Blessings happen when we place ourselves in Jesus' hand like bread, as ordinary as we are. We are bread in his hands in the glory of the majestic creator who created us. It becomes manifest. Every time Jesus took bread in the gospel and he blessed it, in blessing it, he made it something the more. But in another way, he was returning the bread back to what he made it to be in the first place. What we are now is not the original bread he had in mind. Uh, uh, life, life has thrown us a few curveballs and uh, tragedies have hit our doorway and various things have happened happened in our lives and because of that we pulled away from the original loaf that he created us to be and so it's your story whatever it is whatever you've gone through it's your story but it's not the original story it's a story of how you began and why and the story about why God created you in the earth. It's the story of God, the creator, calling you into being with intentionality for a purpose. God called you into being on purpose for a purpose that was for free. So to be blessed is to understand that you were created in the image of God and in God's likeness. And with our frailties and with our failures, we become who he created us to be if we just stay in the bread box long enough to be rebaked and re-needed and reheated. <sighs> ah, Jesus. And then the son pursues us, pursues us by name, and then through salvation, he returns us back through his salvific work to the original plan of God for our lives. And the God who called light out of darkness will call us out of darkness into the marvelous light. And so for our God to continually have us on his mind, that he would pursue us back to the bread box is the ultimate definition of being blessed. Your life is bread in Jesus' hands. He took the bread and he blessed the bread. And then he broke the bread. Now y'all might exit on this part. He broke it. In the hands of God, your life becomes broken in new ways. And when you place the brokenness of your failures and frailties and suffering in Jesus' hand, you become open to the grace and the mercy of God. And this brokenness is not about wallowing in sin or fixating on how miserable you are. To be broken is to allow the grace of God to humble us and to lead us into vulnerability with others and to transform hearts. Bread that is not broken can't be shared. Bread that is not broken cannot be be shared. Okay. Bread that is not broken can't be shared. Wow. 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 
Why did the breaking of bread have such significance in the early church? It's because broken bread points to the humanity of Jesus. The son of glory took it upon himself in the form of a servant. He lowered himself and became a man. The bread itself is the most basic and lowly and cheapest uh, food that we can buy, but it's a symbol of humility and the lowliness of Jesus. Jesus became accessible to all, just as bread is available to everyone, rich and poor. The breaking of of the bread reminds us, now this is the part where y'all might be a little upset with me, but the bread of bread reminds us of the cross on which our Lord's body was broken. Bread is made from crushed wheat. Uh, uh, and wine is made from crushed grapes. Uh, and I'll go so far as to say oil comes from crushed uh, You cannot become what you're supposed to become by bypassing the crushing. Uh, The breaking of bread not only depicts the death of of Christ, but it also shows forth his resurrection. The grain of wheat had to go in the ground in order to come up and become mature grain. See, we want to go up, but we don't want to go down. Grapes had to be crushed and pressed in order to become wine. John 6 and 53 tells us that if we eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood, we obtain his life. It's symbolic of the resurrection, life coming out of death. You want to be anointed. You want to be power. You want to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Once you get a piece of paper, well, get some crushing, baby. Get some crushing. See, we don't like that part of our story. We don't want to be crushed. We don't want to go through life and death. We don't want sickness or a pandemic or financial ruins or loss of relationship. No one wants these things as part of their story. But we break because the world is broken. Creation is groaning. Romans 8 and 22 says, the earth is groaning. Hurricanes and tornadoes and natural disasters, the earth is groaning. So when a fractured world touches us, when the earth shifts beneath our feet, we become broken. I'm almost finished. We become broken and it is an opportunity to understand our inability to fix things on our own. But there is one greater than us who is still in control of everything and Nothing is in control of him. And sometimes it's the brokenness of life that forces us into the hand of God who blesses us. Redemption and deliverance and loving kindness, mercy and revival, they come out of brokenness. How you going to tell God we'll make a way somehow if you ain't never been broke? How can you say that love will live again if you ain't never been divorced? I'm not going to call all the roll because I don't want to come down your road. So when a fracturing world touches us, when the earth shifts beneath our feet, we become broken in it as an opportunity to understand that God is still on the throne. As leaders, we have to remember that those we serve are just as broken as us. We just happen to have the mic. (laughs) But we are just as broken as those we are ministering to. Bread that is not broken cannot be shared. So he took it and blessed it, and he broke it, and he... Ah, y'all with me. Y'all just want me to sit down. Okay. (laughs) But when we look at this passage of feeding the 5,000, the people were hungry, and they told Jesus about it, expecting him to do something. 
And in verse 41, he took the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up to heaven and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to disciples. Watch this now. Look at what Jesus did. He took the provisions, what the people needed, and he gave it back to the apostles, to the leaders. He gave it back to the leaders to do the ministry, and he continued to bless it and break it, and he gave it because when he's doing the blessing and the breaking, it's a miraculous transformation, and it just keeps multiplying. So it's Jesus' responsibility to multiply it. It's the leader's job to distribute it. The openness that comes from being broken is meant so that we can lead outward and onward and to the next level. There is a hunger in the world around us. There's a deep anticipation that there has to be more and we are the more, but you cannot circumvent the process. He will take you. And he will bless you with the original plan he had in mind for your life. But before you can give anything, you got to be broken first. So don't try to go give something and you ain't been broken. It's in the brokenness that it will cause and give you humility in the giving. But see, if you have not been broken, then you're going to be arrogant with your giving because you ain't been through nothing. When your life becomes blessed and broken in Jesus' hands, he gives you out for the life of the world. He gives you a way. You become the way others find the bread of life himself. But in order to be the agent of this gift, you have to let him take you and bless you and break you. I ain't going through all the rest of this stuff because I'm just going to get happy by myself. (laughs) So we are taken off the scene for a while when God is going to use us. And sometimes we're isolated so we can be alone with the baker who is God. Then Jesus gave it back to the leaders and he distributed it and he did the multiplying and the production. The miracles are his doing. Because if you read the text, Jesus, the text says he just kept giving and giving. So as it is distributed, He's making more. The more we give out, the more it multiplies. Regardless of the type of bread, the French have baguettes and croissants. Chinese have steamed rolls with meat in them. Indians have na. Mexicans have tortilla, English have scones. All Americans have sliced bread. Bread just makes itself available to be taken, blessed, broken, and given to the one in need, regardless of who they are.